Greetings, welcome to the Rolling River Nursery. This is a project of the nonprofit organization Planting Justice. We are so excited to be here today to visit with Gavin, one of the founders, who's going to tell us all about what they're doing here and why. So let's go and have a little picnic lunch in the back of the nursery and see what it's all about. Really, you know, it's part of the mission of Planting Justice to sow the seeds of health and justice and sustainability wherever we go. And we've built about 450 gardens throughout the Bay Area, but never had we had like our own land, our own space to really cultivate and grow and um, build the kind of community that, um, that we've wanted to build. And Sobrani Park has you know, been here as a community for not that long. It was built after World War II um, and has faced just enormous amount of disinvestment and violence, systemic violence, structural violence. Um, it was started as a, as a whites only community uh, for white returning veterans. Um, and yet this land was about 50 years prior to that was being grown on by Japanese immigrants who were running nursery businesses and farms throughout this community. And then they weren't even allowed to buy homes here when, when the community was built. Um, and then going back before that, we're standing on very close to an Ohlone village site. This is Lashawn Creek, otherwise known as San Leandro Creek. Uh, it goes out to the bay. Um, and Karina Gould, one of the founders, one of our uh, leaders in the Ohlone um, movement here in the Bay Area, she lives on 103rd, but her family is Lashawn, is Lashawn Band of Ohlone. So many, many, many generations of her family have lived on this land as well. So when Planting Justice came here, um, really, we knew that our goal was to, you know, create living wage jobs for people in the community, help people come home from prison or to avoid going to prison um, through really good, dignified living wage work, but also to honor the land in ways that would inspire people to recognize where we're, where we're standing and how we got here. Um, so, you know, myself, I'm, I'm mixed race, you know, my, my family come, came from Mexico, from Lebanon, from Ireland and from Germany. And they were farmers and they came here. And here I am in California, a fourth generation Californian, and trying to do right with my life. But what, what injuries have happened on this land? What kind of knowledge was here before we were here? Um, and how do we come together as a community now in 2018, given all of the enormous violence and um, challenges that we face, to really make a world that is acceptable to you know, the g generations to come? You know? and, uh, it, it has to be, I believe, with the, um, you know, restructuring of our relationships with all of life and recognizing that we're not separate from nature, um, we're from this earth, you know, where our blood, you know, our bones, our skin, it's all shared with all of life. Those same minerals have been passed from life force to life force to life force. And now here we are conscious of this life. So what do we do with it? You know, I don't know anything else to do but um, to plant trees, to help other people, to you know get um, back in relationship with the plants and soil, and to come. We, you know, I think the solutions are within all of us. Like we all bring a piece of it. We all kind of know um, what needs to happen, and so here we are. You know, we have space to do that. So you know, um, Diane has been blessing this space as um, you know one of the educators here and has been working in the Indian rights uh, organizing community for 30 or 40 years and was friends with Karina Gould and Janella. Um, I know some of you were at the Glen Cove, um, you know, occupation, which started Segorate Land Trust to fight that sacred land, uh, for that sacred land. And Segorate Land Trust is currently in fights right now to prevent their cemeteries and their sacred lands from being further desecrated and developed. But then here we are on sacred land as well, you know, and so what do we do with that land? So it was, um, you know, really a seed that Diane and others kind of set here to bring back the wholeness of the relationships. And so we're offering this land back to Ohlone people, to the Segorte Land Trust, 
uh, forever for the long term. Uh, our goal is to pay off the $600,000 loan that we still have to pay and then to put the land, put the two acres in the Segorite Land Trust so that it's forever in indigenous stewardship. Um, and then, you know, a Segorite Land Trust can hopefully allow us to continue doing the farm and the nursery here that we're doing that is all about bringing good jobs and good food uh, to communities that have been structurally denied access to those things. Here's some squashes, some mint, cilantro. Yeah, this is kind of the, the, what, is, what, are, what is this, this is for? kind of the leftovers of the, our winter garden. We use it as a teaching space. Yeah, okay. we have our high school youth okay. and other people come back. It's a teaching garden. It's a teaching and garden. Who eats it? You we guys? harvest it. We give it away to staff to the community. Oh, oh nice, nice. We have a, a free farm stand. One of our staff members is a caterer and has connections to like other farmers and stuff. So she'll take the seconds of leftovers at farmers markets and set them up here and just give them out to people. Very cool. But yeah, yeah we're looking at just like there's maybe like 50 different varieties of edible plants in these eight eight raised beds. Eight raised beds, <laughs> and you've got 50 varieties Probably. of plants. Yeah. It's just all all they different grow well together. And, yeah. yeah, I mean there's the sage, the mint, beautiful sage leaves. Yeah, squash, perennial kale different sages. This is what like uh, Tree. Parsley, parsley that's gone to seed. Yeah, yeah, parsley means the uh -huh. cilantro over here. Uh -huh. Some mints, some dinosaur kale. Yep. Some tree so collards. We'll, uh, you know, we'll keep the perennials in and we'll plant new annuals probably in the next couple weeks for the summer garden with some of the tomatoes and uh, chiles and other things like that. Yeah, that's all like, yeah, a bunch of stuff's gone to seed, you know, so um, the birds still come and, yeah. you know, take it and. I love that sage. So, um, so it's a teaching garden and a community garden. Yeah. That you're managing for the community. Yeah. Corn. Corn. Yeah. Broccoli. Oh, I love this broccoli. Yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful sunflower that's about to come oh, up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see the thyme over here. Uh huh. Yeah, and then maybe we'll. Uh... What are these, Gavin? This is some type of broccoli family. No. Oh, okay. um, Something will come out in the middle, huh? Perfect. It could be, um, it could be Brussels sprouts. Ooh, no, I want to grow yeah. those. Or, yeah, some type of, like, leaf cabbage. We eat those all the time. Yeah. So with this one, this, this is what is so amazing, this one space, you're able to grow food, teach people how to grow food, provide people with the food you grow, and, um, and yep. teach them, and then consult them, and build community, and yep. give away the food, sell the food, create community around it. Yeah, and we, we often are building these raised beds, so we're teaching people how to build raised beds as well too, um, because oftentimes people don't have places that have healthy topsoil where you can, we can grow in the ground. We've done about 450 garden builds throughout Oakland, and about 100 of them have been for free or sliding scale. So often, you know, in East Oakland near here, we'll reinvest the surplus of working for clients where we can charge, you know, what our costs are plus and then the plus gets reinvested into um, building gardens for free or sliding scale. Perfect. So we've been, yeah, done about maybe almost a quarter of the gardens um, that we've built have been sliding scale or for free. Yeah, so we've planted um, the whole perimeter with trees. I These are all that. like young avocado trees. We have about 20 varieties of avocados in the ground. Wow. So we come, come out here in a uh, you know, few years and you know, we'll have a lot more shade than just this one walnut tree right here. So this is Ooh. our most recent greenhouse. We've just we've just built two greenhouses in the past month and a half or so. Great. So this one we're still setting up, getting the benches going, but these are all for uh, cuttings. So basically, we do a lot of our propagation from cuttings. So the farm in El Sobrante is our mother farm. Um, so that's where we're growing. We have about maybe 1,200, 1,500 fruit trees in the ground. Not only will we be harvesting fruit and food off of those trees, but those trees are the mother trees for the nursery. So we have two of each variety planted in the ground. So like in our fig section, we have 60 varieties of figs, two of each. It's about 120 fig trees out there. Same with the pomegranates, there's about 60 varieties of pomegranates. We plant two of each. So we're taking cuttings off of those and a cutting is just a piece of the, of the branch. You know, we chop it off the tree in the right time of the year after it's fruited and the leaves have dropped. And then we cut that branch into sections and then put those into the soil and if it's the right type of tree, like a fig or a pomegranate or an olive, mulberry, grape, kiwi, all these things, you can propagate that way. And so each little section of, of branch will become a, a new tree, tree, you know? And so what we're looking at here is actually 
the potential energy is of a forest. You know, mm. we're looking at a few thousand trees, mulberries, olives, elderberries, kiwis, figs, uh, pomegranates, more figs back there. And we'll walk through and you can just, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing to view such a, such a tiny little twig and, yes. and know that, you know, that's a tree that can live hundreds of years and give food for longer than we'll be alive. And it's just starting out it, as, it, you know. It begs the question, Gavin, twig. is this as easy as you make it look? I mean, it seems like uh, there's all this food for people <clears throat> here, potential food, if food growing. It's um, a low barrier of entry, you yeah. know, like you do a few seasons of land-based work and most of us are kind of remembering, you know, parts of it as well too that we sort of have in our DNA. It's in the DNA. In, you know? Yes. Um, so you do. I mean, it's not that hard to do cuttings and start seeds and know when they're ready to be transplanted and know how to carefully transplant them. And um, grafting takes some practice. That's right. something that um, some people are just kind of innately good at because they have really good fine motor skills and. Others like me, I'm kind of not a very good grafter. Like I don't really graft very well. Um, but you know, after doing it a couple hundred or a couple thousand times, anybody can, you know, get, you know, get the practice and get good at it. So. But this is producing food. This is sustenance. This is what nurtures life. You would think this would be the first thing we'd want to learn and pay attention to before it was getting training, you know, training for skills for a job. <laughs> we can go work and then buy the food. Like exactly. we can cut out that whole equation and just learn to grow the food and produce food. Yeah. Boom. Not that we'll never need a job or anything, but yeah. it just seems like it'd be one of the first things you'd want to learn. It's yeah. fundamental, right? Producing our own food. And Better late than never, though. Here, I'm a guy in his mid-40s coming and saying, I think I feel I want to grow some food. Right. I feel like, why aren't I doing that? Right. And why aren't we all? It's ridiculous for me to say, why aren't we all, if I didn't even do it. So, yeah. got to start here. I mean, the mental health benefits of being out in the garden, even if we're out in the middle, you know, deep East Oakland, there's a freeway over there, you know, but like, just getting our hands in the soil, you know, it's really it compares favorably to antidepressant medication is just being out in the garden and working getting the you know soil under your finger fingernails and um, and yet so many people have been structurally denied access to land and so that's the thing like you know yes it's great to be able to go work in the garden and also whose land are you on and who's not being you know given access to which is really a human right like it's a human right to have a plot of earth that you can cultivate and be in relationship to it. And so that's part of our mission at PJ too. It's just like, you know, so many of us that we, we've set up so many gardens on asphalt. You know, we, we put down we put down wood chips beds. on the ground to yeah. cover the asphalt so mm -hmm. that you don't see it. You can pretend for a moment it's not there. Plant some raised beds or get some old wine barrels, cut them in half and plant trees in those, you know, and you can have a garden. But you know, that's that's one of the real kind of you know critiques. It's it's not just about like, oh garden gardening but it's gardening with like this kind of social justice you know awareness of about like how do we you know redistribute you know wealth land in a way that's you know just and equitable mm, it's certainly a proclamation of our desire and our willingness to compromise and to make effort to participate in regeneration regenerative agriculture regenerative culture yeah regenerating ourselves and our and the human species our human family yeah. yeah i love this i can see these are fig leaves around yeah, here and then i look down and there's a fig big. it's nothing but a little, <laughs> little twig but it's a twig with a fig Ki kiwis behind you. Oh, these are kiwis, mm -hmm. yeah. Do they, they grow kind of vines, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. One kiwi plant can have two or three hundred pounds of fruit on it when it's mature. Yeah, okay, I'll take again? one or two, please. <laughs> My name is Bill. Bill? Okay, Bill. I never knew about this, and now I knew something new, and now you're getting ready to know something new. Fishman. Fishman. Did you know about this? No, I just read it. Come on now. <laughs> okay, now squeeze this like this. Squeeze okay. it like this. And smell the hand. And then smell it. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a fish meal. Come on. Vietnamese soup. Oh, yeah, Vietnamese, you often get yeah. This, you know, get this herb. Is that awesome? Everywhere you see a peg on this outer circle is going to be a redwood tree. Mm, um, and oh. then on the inside circle as well, there's going to be more redwood poles. And then it'll be open to the sky in the middle. It's going to take up this whole area. Um, and the uh, sacred fire pit is in the, uh, the middle. And then this will be used um, by Ohlone people and other indigenous people, native folks from all over 
the world who have, you know, live in Oakland um, and non-Indigenous people too, depending on the protocol and how things are decided, um, you know, as a way of, you know, just giving back land to Native people to be able to do the ceremony and language reclamation and dance um, and, the, and the things that they haven't had space to do because they're not a federally recognized tribe, the Ohlone people, and they don't have a land base. Um, so, yeah, that'll be this whole area. There's gonna be water catchment off of uh, the roof, and um, yeah, it's starting starting here with this with this space. We had our first avocado festival this last year because we're gonna be buying 200. Two, we bought 2,500 avocados last year. Um, and we're really buying them for the seed, but of course the fruit is so amazing. So we had this festival in the community where people would bring their own ingredients and we, we supplied the avocados. We had this guacamole uh, contest, you know, uh, people would do guacamoles yeah, and man. the winners would take home fruit trees. We had judges uh, and all this stuff. Man. And it was right before the holiday season, so people were taking home a lot of mm. avocado fruit for the holidays. So these are the, um, the, uh, the, the seeds that are grown out and then we'll be grafting these with all the different varieties of avocados. So I showed you the, the cutting. Some of the things you can just take a fig branch and put it in soil, cut it up and put it in the soil and it grows a new tree. But a lot of the things we do are by, um, by grafting. So these will all be grafted. These are avocado seeds that are all grown from the same variety, bacon avocados. And then from there we'll graft on the, the Haas and the Pinkerton and all the different varieties of avocados onto them. We do a foliar spray um, every two weeks on the whole nursery. Um, sometimes we're using a fish emulsion and sometimes we're using compost teas. Um, our most recent, recent batch that we made was from uh, wild harvested nettle and horsetail. So both of those are found near creeks in the East Bay Hills and they're amazing plant fertilizers. We just harvest the nettle and horsetail, cut them up into little pieces, put them in a five gallon bucket and fill it with water and let it rot. Mm -hmm. And that rotted nettle tea it smells awful um, but you mm. dilute that like 40 parts water to mm. one part tea and then spray the whole nursery plants love it and plants love it mm. yeah same thing people would often use um, fish um, they would gather fish from the creeks and bring those and plant like the fish head or the bones into their trees when they're planting trees and that you know is a way of recycling recycling the nutrients from calcium the bones and all the nutrients from the fish as well and so that's another kind of ancient way of, of fertilizing your your plants and you know um, yeah I, th I think it's just it's important I, I definitely respect like the, the choice that people make to not consume animals and also knowing though that farms, the way that people produce vegetables is often using or hurting animal ecosystems as well too. So kind of broadening our understanding of what agriculture does to ecosystems and how growing a monoculture, you know, thousand acres of corn or Soy. lettuce or yeah. broccoli or whatever might be growing on these commercial scale industrial farms is really you, you're having to basically kill all the life that was there before it was a farm and then so that you can grow your your monoculture you know products so we're you know just kind of recognizing that we're alive um, you know with the energy of lots of living things that are not now alive and that our bodies are also then providing life to other life forms you know all the bacteria that's in our bodies you know that we couldn't live without you know so we're not just a human being that's separate from animals or other life forms, you know, we, we couldn't exist if not for all of the non-human cells that are in our body helping us to digest food and all mm. of that. And, and the way that that, you know, food system is really interconnected as mm. well too. Believe it or not, we're not just us. Here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Elderberries and currants, gooseberries, raspberries, um, a lot of different currant varieties too. That's what these all are. So this is the size of tree that we're, um, after it's been a cutting or it's been grafted and it's a young tree, we pot it up into this size pot and then ship them all over the country or grow them in our own gardens for our own landscaping clients or our own um, you know, school gardens and the educational gardens that we do. 
We have a whole education program that I didn't mention at all either. Wait, but that you just works did? In, yeah. Hey, I heard you have a, is there some education program or what, yeah. what are you we're, doing with we're schools? We're working at, Oh, we're working at prisons and juvenile detention facilities and high schools throughout the Bay Area. Uh -huh. So we work at about six um, public high schools on a regular basis and then another six or ten high schools throughout the course of a year where we have larger scale community gardens and we go in and we, you know, we make smoothies, we make medicinal you know, tinctures and salves and doing a lot of cooking and culinary arts from those gardens um, and teaching young people about not just this garden, but about the food system and about land sovereignty, cultural sovereignty, food sovereignty, and how this garden is really a part of a much larger global movement mm. about reconnecting, you know, um, in those ways. Beautiful. And why is it that we have Cheetos and candy bars for breakfast? Because that's what's available in our community, you know, and how did it get to be that way? And what was it like a few generations ago when people had access to land and communities were living more you know, land-based lifestyles. Um, yeah, so that's the education program. We also do that at San Quentin, where we do a garden in the medium security unit of the prison. We work at Santa Rita and at uh, three juvenile detention facilities as well, where we have gardening um, and education programs as well. Well, it sounds like a wonderful recipe for rehabilitation, which is what those places are uh, ostensibly designed to do, uh, is some actual rehabilitation of of our humanity yeah getting back in touch with again our part and our role in, in nature and then what can we do about it say we realize wait i'm nature I sh well, what do i do yeah enter planning justice right got it from behind us too is this other shade house with thousands and thousands more cuttings so there's just like so many trees you know that I'm, coming into being in this, yeah, this land. I mean, it inspires me so much. Like you said, this is thousands. Each one can produce a bunch of food, and this is thousands. Yeah. And it was just a twig in dirt. Yeah. And each one can produce so many more trees as well. Yes. From it. So all the seeds yes, it's are all infinite. the other. It's yeah. infinite, just like nature. The potential energy is... But what's beyond even... the beyond? Olives are good. I think down the road, I wouldn't mind getting into some olives and yeah. cur curing them and everything, making totally, my own definitely. olives. Absolutely. You see a lot of olive trees around. Some seem to bear fruit, some don't. But I don't know anyone who's actually curing them and eating them. Yeah. No one. Not one. I've never heard of a human doing that. <laughs> Not common in California. And we're saying we have such olives here. I know. And and California olive oils, of course. And then this is this beautiful yes. uh, natural building that we did so we uh, saved a little square of what's on the inside so that you can actually see what it's made of um, come in have to move some of this stuff but uh, yeah we left this square so that you can see what's behind the plaster it's wood pallets you know that are basically a waste product from shipping all the goods that get shipped all around here stuffed with plastic and straw and then plastered over with the natural plaster, which is clay, sand, and straw, and water. Adobe, um, pretty yep. much, right? And then recycled glass yeah, bottles. and that's beautiful. Yeah. That's, a, that's a rose window. I've seen some nice churches, but that's a rose window. Yeah. Do those bottles have liquid in them? They don't. Or actually, they do. Yeah, so, some of them don't. That's yeah, some yeah. A lot of the plant propagation stuff happens where we're potting on newly potted trees with our soil mix that we make here. And part of um, what what keeps this thing going is people buying plants from your nursery and trees and plants and shrubs. And you absolutely. ship them all over the country. Yep, going you ship internationally going or only, only Just domestic? in the 48 continental 48, yeah. U.S. states. Yeah, yeah rollingrivernursery.com. People go on there, buy trees, look through all the inventory. We pack them up here. And so no matter where you are in the continental United States, you can buy trees that are created here and uh, we're growing things for all the different climates throughout the 48 continental United States. So we're shipping to the East Coast, to the South, to the Northwest, to California, uh, Midwest, all over the country. So it's a little counterintuitive. You would think they have these growing regions and, and certain things won't grow here, but you're growing everything here. Is that that you can start them here, they just won't flourish and fruit exactly. as like well Exactly. Like we'll here. grow cranberries here that we sell we sell them when they're this tall yeah then they go out to the place where they're gonna grow which forever. they wouldn't do here and they wouldn't yeah. they wouldn't fruit very well here we're growing all kinds of different things out if you planted them in the ground here 
they wouldn't fruit very well. But we have such a forgiving climate in California, we can pretty much grow most of mm -hmm. everything, especially with the greenhouses, mm -hmm. to be about a year or two old to then where it goes to its final place where it grows. And then it depends on your climate and how much cold and heat you have. So is this the only actual source of revenue you're bringing in, is selling plants? For the nursery. Yeah. 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 And then we do the landscaping service. Um, and then we have the farm in El Sobrante, which is a couple years away still of having an enormous amount of food from all the trees, trees we've planted. Yeah. And then we do the grassroots organizing, kind of uh, canvassing, fundraising. For donations. For donations. Yeah. So it's most, mm -hmm. it's, is it more donor supported than commerce supported right now? Yeah, we generate about half a million through our nursery and landscaping services, and then the rest of the organization. Yeah, they're like from. million and a half, according to the article in the New York Times. Yeah, so it it's about from, yeah, it's about a million donations. from our own programs, yeah. including the canvassing. Yeah. Um, and then our budget last year was two point two million. Yeah. Yeah. So 30, 32 full time staff. About half of our staff are formerly incarcerated. Um, we pay living wages. We start at seventeen fifty an hour. Um, full-time work, so uh, people are getting medical, dental, vision, health insurance, life insurance, um, chiropractic insurance. We you know, really want to make sure people are taking good care of themselves, and we give everybody at least one month of paid time off per year. So you know, people need a lot of time to reconnect with their families or go to the DMV or figure out the other things in their life that they need to do. Um, so yeah, everyone gets at least that as a starting starting wage. It's quite a model. Just the model that you've reversed it. It's not here to make a profit. It's here to nurture yourselves, your community, your people working for you and beyond. Yeah. And then we'll worry about how to make it work. Well, we need to do it. Yeah. Right? You just jumped in and bravo. I mean, that takes that takes some gumption and some courage and, and some smarts. And um, yeah, and some trust too, some that trust. people will see it and want to support it, you know? And uh, yeah, I mean, we're starting a project. This nursery was run by a family who put everything that they had, their whole heart and soil, soul, working seven days a week soil. on soil. <laughs> and then also with the help of unpaid interns who would come and live at that farm and in exchange for room and board, they would help the family run the business. Um, but that's not really an appropriate model for this context where, you know, living wages where people are trying to stay in Oakland, not get evicted and kicked out of their, you know, the cities and the houses where they've lived for a long time, but how to kind of translate that model. So it was a big risk that we were taking, knowing that, okay, if we're paying living wage for the amount of labor that's needed to run this nursery, we're going to take a loss for at least the first four or five years. So we're planning on doing that, but we don't see it as taking a loss. It's really an investment. We believe so much in the plant stock that's here, you know, how important globally these varieties are, some of, some of which we're the only nursery on the continent that has certain varieties up here that we're taking care of. You know, and then also the social mission of what we're doing as well. So trust that foundations and donors and major donors, you know, people will see that it's here in East Oakland and that it, you know, is definitely a, a unique project that deserves a lot of support. Definitely a unique project, definitely deserves a lot of support. And then obviously we want to help you spread the word and encourage people to participate and contribute. and join community with you and look for your guidance and counsel advice and support in starting their own thing maybe similar or a branch of it or just help it grow yep or just plant more food and help your neighbors plant food and help the kids in the school plant food and learn how to plant food please got it <laughs> let's do that so why are you doing all this what what, what was like what was the impetus to get started <clears throat> man um myself and Hale, my partner and co-founder of the organization we were doing a lot of anti-war organizing prior to this. Um, I was 18 when I first fully dove into political activism as a way that I was going to spend my time outside of school. Uh, most of the jobs I've had have been political activism of some kind. And I did a lot of canvassing. You know, I started my freshman year of college, 9-11 happened within my first two weeks of going to school, the lead up to the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, I didn't really know what to do, so um, I took some time away from school and just started canvassing with a group called Peace Action. I went and knocked on maybe 10, 20,000 doors in cities across the western U.S., basically like asking people to write letters to their congressman and senator. You know, it's kind of, didn't really know what to do and it was that this was, uh, you know, a way of just like learning what people were thinking, you know. And for me, 
I was kind of realizing through a lot of that work that instead of fighting against the things that we don't want to see in the world, I want to be putting my energy into things that are building the world that we do need, um, that the Senate and Congress aren't going to fix our problems for us. And even if we can write them 10,000 letters, which we were basically doing, it still didn't stop the lead up to the war in Iraq and the military industrial complex, which is such a huge um, you know, crisis that we're facing, we've inherited. So what do we do? You know, and so basically kind of my own like mental health and physical health and recognizing what a sustainable activism look like over the course of a lifetime, you know, like fighting against, fighting against, and continuing to react against the onslaughts that are coming from everywhere, it seems at times, especially with this administration, people just, you know, that's not a really a way to live or organize, you know. Um, it's important, we gotta be fighting against the things that are happening, mm. but at the same time, we also need to be, you know, replacing those systems which are actually crumbling and failing to meet the needs and are going to be replaced by something later. Um, so we need to spend our energy, at least myself, um, you know, building things that we do need that are going to be feeding people and creating jobs in a way that the capitalist extractive economy isn't mm. doing. You know, so it's basically that's kind of where it started. And our goal is, you know, to be in this work for the rest of our lives. Hopefully we have 50 more years at least of doing this and that we're creating a model that other organizations and other cities and other people around the country can adopt. Because like I said before, the food system is crumbling and changing um, and needs to be reimagined. Um, and we want to bring food and farming back to mm. where people are living and working and playing and all of that. And, uh, but people need models of how to do that. Mm. Um, it's not going to be something that foundations are just going to fund forever and make happen you know it's going to have to be business models yeah. and you know the all the database and the back end the accounting all the legal stuff all of the those things that are really difficult for people to figure out especially if you don't have a lot of race class gender privilege and you know have college degrees and time to figure all those things out so we want to do a lot of that figuring out and then help people you know be able to do parts of it or all of it um, whatever sort of makes sense for their context. Well, it sounds like you've had your personal evolution from rebelling against what is to seeking solutions to it. And that's a beautiful thing to see in anyone, and it's always an inspiration to see in anyone. And you really believe in open source, sharing the, the tools of the trade, your, your secrets and, and um, tips and tricks with people, again, who want to grow or start their own thing or, or replicate your model. Yep. It's beautiful. I mean... Sharing is caring, what more can I say? Right? Yep. Um, so any kind of last takeaways you want, want people to, to know about you or planning justice or growing food or what we're doing here? What's... Um, let's see, I mean, I think it's just like not to get overwhelmed with, um, you know, the crises that we're facing, you know, like I think the solutions are embarrassingly simple. The problems are super complex. Um, <laughs> But yeah, um, just to, you know, to not give up hope, to work with the people around you, to uh, break down barriers around class, ethnicity, language. You know, we all want to be able to grow healthy food and create beautiful gardens, no matter what language you speak or where you're from. You know, that's something kind of innate in people that they, they become happier being yeah. in a garden full of flowers and food. You yeah. know? And so how do we then put enough pressure on city councils or mayors or county board of supervisors or corporations or landowners to be able to get some of that land back and be able to do that. And that may look different in other places, but also maybe some of the, mm. the ways that we're doing with the business models that we're doing and working with schools and other strategic partners is a way that other people can, can you know, also get access to land. It seems to me like in that triad, the, the people are the, your, your best bet, you know, I mean, the corporations, they're, by law, their um, profit motive has to be their primary function. And with governments, their hands are tied with the red tape and the bureaucracy and all so many layers mm -hmm. of it. Yet people, landowners or, or uh, philanthropists, just everyday citizens mm -hmm. have the capacity to recognize how valuable this is. And you brought up a beautiful point I never thought about. I always talk about how music is a universal language. Smile is, a, is an international language. But food and plants and growing food, yeah. that's, that's universal too. Flowers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. a rose is a ro rose by any other name, right? Yep. 
Yeah, it's a beautiful thing you're doing here, and we appreciate your your time being able to come and check For it sure. out and sharing the bounty of your harvest with us, like in every way. It's such a cool thing. <laughs> Thank too. you.